Hi and welcome back. Uh, this is week four of the philosophy course and this week we're going to move on to questions of logic and we're going to focus this week on formal logic. Now up to now we've largely just been discussing materialism and different questions related to it. But Marx's philosophy isn't just materialist, it's also dialectical materialism. And elements of this we have touched upon in previous weeks. That is true, for example, when we discussed um, the problems of scepticism in bourgeois philosophy and doubt about the existence of an external world. I pointed out that that was related partly to problems of thought associated with formal logic, with a tendency to sort of isolate different things. Uh, but we haven't got into it properly. And of course, logic is very important to philosophy. So it is important that we begin to discuss this. Uh, and before we discuss dialectical logic, um, we're going to discuss, as I said, formal logic, which Marxism uh, is critical of, shall we say. Um, and so, yeah, well, let's just start on, on a discussion of that. So logic, what is logic? For us, logic are, are laws of thought, really. Uh, or an attempt to describe what the laws of thought are. Now, for materialists, uh, these laws of thought are derived from the real laws of the material world, the general features of the material world, which governs ultimately our thought. Um, you know, for example, uh, we can say that there is a logical principle um, because it's the case that... Uh, in the real world, objects have certain relations or regularities with one another. They can't contradict one another or, you know, um, uh, certain types of things exist in relation to, in certain kinds of relations to other things. And from these general features, uh, we draw certain principles like, uh, you know, the idea of, of, uh, of, of different kinds of um, species, for example, and that something must be, must belong to one thing and not to another thing. Uh, this reflects the, the, the most general features of the material world. And if it contradicted it, then it would ultimately have to be illogical. However, um, for many philosophers, especially for formal logicians, shall we say, um, logic really has nothing to do with the material world. Um, it's merely a set of rules for how we should think, irrelevant of what the world is like. Um, and for them, these rules are sort of self-sufficient. They are, you know, they, they only refer to themselves. They don't come from anywhere else. And they are self-evident, you know, like uh, the idea of two plus two equals four. And so there's no, um, there's no need to say anything or to prove their origin in the material world for them. Um, now, for us, as I said, that is the opposite of the truth. And... Logic is not really a set of rules for thought in the sense of um, you don't need to have studied logic to be able to think properly, because as I said, it re merely reflects the general principles that we have abstracted from the world. Hegel ironically put this uh, when he said that um, logic, the study of logic no more teaches you how to think than uh, the study of digestion teaches you how to digest. You, you're still able to digest regardless of whether or not you have studied that. Um, formal logic um, started out as a discipline, if you like, um, with Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher, who codified it really into a set of... And he was the first one to really sort of propose, uh, you know, logic as a sort of distinct discipline with a set of rules. And so he codified it in a sense. And its most famous and central... Uh, rule is the law of non-contradiction and of identity. So basically stated it is that A equals A and does not equal B, you know, so you can't say that an, ob an object doesn't equal itself. You can't say that um, a person is uh, some other person and yet not themselves. Like they can only be themselves and they can't be somebody else. And this, of course, uh, is a very useful, although an extremely basic and kind of obvious thing to say. Um, and our criticism of it is that it ultimately is very one-sided and um, kind of empty, really. Um, but nevertheless, it is an important insight. It is based really on the principle of abstraction. So human thought really is all about abstraction. 
And what is abstraction? Well, when we abstract something, we we isolate certain features of it. So if we talk about, um, we have the, the abstract concept of sharpness, right? So we, we find objects that are sharp and we sort of, we abstract that characteristic from them and then talk about that as if it exists independently of those of that object. And also by abstracting, we, we, we tend to sort of concentrate on a specific object. So we might discuss, you know, a certain species of animal and uh, we concentrate on its features, right? We, we isolate it in a sense. And, and that's what abstraction is all about. It's about sort of um, concentrating on certain things um simplifying them and um thereby gaining an understanding of them and this is an absolutely vital uh, ability if we, we couldn't do this then we wouldn't actually be able to think at all um and lenin says uh the following he says thoughts proceeding from the concrete to the abstract provided it is correct of course it's possible to make a, a false abstraction does not get away from the truth but comes closer to it the abstraction of matter or law of nature, the abstraction of value, etc. In short, all scientific or correct abstractions reflect nature more deeply, truly and completely. From living perception to abstract thought, and from this to practice, such as the dialectical path of the cognition of truth, of the cognition of objective reality. So for us as Marxists, we don't say that this is is uh, useless this formal logic which is based on abstraction is absolutely essential and by abstracting something in a sense you do arrive at a profounder truth than merely you know seeing the thing that is in front of you and, and treating it as a one-off object you you discover its general properties basically so it's an enormously powerful tool really and that's really the secret to to the power of humanity um but there, there's also ultimately uh, a one-sided falseness to abstraction and therefore to formal logic as well. And both formal logic and abstraction are dangerous for this reason uh, because by tearing something out of its context and concentrating on it and simplifying it, uh, we are in a sense saying something that is also untrue. On the one hand, it is, as I've said, it's a deeper truth. It's also on the same, at the same time kind of untrue because of course that feature such as sharpness, you know, or as Lenin says, uh, matter, uh, these are never really exist as such, and they always exist in a far more complex and changing reality than what our abstraction really um, is about. So, yes, it allows us to isolate certain details and come to understand them, um, but there's a limit to this. It kind of kills the object in a sense. It rips it out of its real context in, in, in real nature. Um, it removes the, the sense of fluidity um, that, that is, is true, that is real uh, in any given object. Everything changes, everything exists in a complex web of interrelations and abstraction essentially loses this. Although in, in a certain sense, it also understands it because by giving something a general property like sharpness, you are also bringing it in relation, of course, to all other things that are sharp or, or things that aren't sharp. Um, but nevertheless, in the, ma the main, what you're tending to do is to take things out of their context, to concentrate on this object and ignoring its real history and uh, interconnections and dependencies. Um, and so the danger of this approach is that we lose, you know, we, we end up actually misunderstanding the nature of reality. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so abstraction, by abstracting, we categorize things. Uh, we tend to put things in boxes and, and say that, you know, this species is this species and that species is that species and this species has X characteristics, right? And therefore we are using the law of non-contradiction that I mentioned earlier. We're saying that this, you know, for example, how do we describe a given species? Well, we say that X species has Y characteristics and therefore if you find an animal that has all of Y characteristics, then it must be X species. And in doing so, of course, you have gained some very real knowledge, but you've also, um, you've sort of compartmentalized the thing and you've frozen it so that you don't understand. And there's no ability in, from, in this way of thinking to understand why that kind of animal came about in the first place, where it came from. You know, you can't understand any of these things and, and you've, you've sort of killed it again. So again, this is the danger of, 
of formal logic, the limitation, shall we say, of formal logic. Um, now, this, this, this basic principle that it's based upon, the law of non-contradiction, seems obviously true, A, A equals A, obviously, how could it not? Um, but actually, is it as true what, as it appears? Well, actually, it isn't. And Hegel pointed this out quite brilliantly before Marx. Um, he, he pointed out that it's essentially a tautology. And a tautology is when you say that something is itself, and which is, of course, what to say A equals A is. And the trouble with the tautology is, first of all, it's kind of empty and, and useless. You know, if, if you ask, somebody asks you how tall you are and you say, well, I'm as tall as I am, nothing is, n no real knowledge is gained, of course. Um, now, if we take an example, so if we say uh, a dog is a dog, which again is a tautology, it may appear that we're talking about a dog, but actually you haven't said anything whatsoever about a dog or dogs. And the only reason that you, in discussing this, have perhaps a picture of a dog in your mind is because you have experience of dogs. This statement saying a dog is a dog doesn't tell you anything about the nature of a dog at all. It wouldn't give you a picture of a dog, right? Uh, and so actually, not only is it kind of empty, but it's actually false in a sense. Uh, it's nothing really. Uh, it's not, it isn't, you're not describing a dog. You're not understanding a dog at all. Um, Hegel describes, there's a brilliant passage in, in, in the logic of his books where he says that uh, he takes up the idea of pure existence, which is again really the same thing as saying a dog is a dog, since that isn't actually talking about dogs in any real way. You're just talking about existence, really, abstract existence. And he points out that this is the same as nothing. If you want to talk about anything that is real, any actual object, any actual thing, you have to define it, you have to determine it, you have to say that it's this and not that. You know, it's yellow and not red. You know, it's, it's hard, it's not soft, it's tall and it's not short, whatever. You're defining it and therefore you're limiting it and you're bringing it in relation to other things. You're giving it determinate qualities, as Hegel would say. Uh, but of course, these determinate qualities also have to exist in time because let's take the example of being yellow. Something can only be yellow over time. What is it to be yellow? Well, it's to reflect uh, yellow wavelengths of photons, basically, wavelengths of light. That's why we call something yellow. But you can only do that over time. It's not something that happens outside of time in a pure instance. So any specific quality that something has uh, can only exist, can only be expressed in time and therefore through change, ultimately. Therefore, everything is always changing and the truth of something is in the fact that it changes. Um, and therefore, A does not equal A. And, and I'd like to give a quotation from Trotsky, a very famous passage uh, from the uh, ABC of Materialist Dialectics, where he takes up this apparent obvious truth. And he says, but in reality, A is not equal to A. This is easy to prove if we observe that these two letters under a lens, uh, if we observe these two letters under a lens, they're quite different from each other. But one can object. The question is not the size or the form of the letters, since they're only symbols. But, um, for Symbols for equal quantities, for instance, a pound of sugar. The objection is beside the point. In reality, a pound of sugar is never equal to a pound of sugar. A more delicate scale will always disclose a difference. But again, one can object. Uh, a pound of sugar is equal to itself. Neither is this true, though. All bodies change uninterruptedly in size, weight, colour, etc. They are never equal to themselves. A sophist will respond that a pound of sugar is equal to itself at any given moment. Aside from the extremely dubious practical value of this axiom, it does not withstand theoretical criticism either. How should we really conceive the word moment? If it is an infinitesimal interval of time, then a pound of sugar is subjected during the course of that moment to inevitable changes. Or is the moment a purely mathematical abstraction, that is, a zero of time? But everything exists in time, and existence itself is an uninterrupted process of transformation. Time is consequently a fundamental element of existence. Thus the axiom A is equal to A signifies that a thing is equal to itself if it does not change, if it therefore does not exist. So apologies for that rather long quotation, but it is a very, very good uh, argument and I think it puts it very clearly. So 
Change, therefore, and everything changes all the time. Change means that something is and is not. Now that might seem paradoxical, more ridiculous than saying A equals A. Um, but actually, it is the fun most fundamental truth of how things are. Things are here and there at the same time. Again, that might sound ridiculous. But take um, Zeno's paradox. Zeno's paradox was uh, is a famous paradox that basically asserts that change is impossible um, because it says that for something to get from uh, point A to point C, it must, in the meantime, pass through point B. But to pass, but before it can get at even to point B, it must also pass to another point, and therefore it can never really arrive at point C because it's always stuck at the interval. You know, it's always but before it can get there, it has to get there. Before it can get there, it has to get to this other shorter point. And then you can always break it down further and further. And it's inexplicable how it ever actually gets to see because there's always further points that it has to tra traverse. And essentially what he's arguing is that uh, space can be divided up infinitely and every single part of that, traverse, that, that span of space has to be passed. And if you can divide it even further still, then there's even more points that you have to pass and you can never get through this infinite uh, number of points, essentially. Um, and this is a very, very famous, in philosophy, this is a very famous um, objection. Of course, it's absurd because we all know that things can move and can get from point A to point C. Um, the problem with this, and it, again, it's a problem of formal logic, is that it assumes that, uh, that space is made up of discrete, you know, uh, just infinite number of discrete kind of points, if you like, that must each of which have to be occupied before you can get to the next one. Because in reality, space is not made up of little discrete points. Uh, in reality, it is continuous. And you don't sort of perfectly inhabit one space, one absolute point, and then suddenly pop into the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. In reality, you are flowing through a continuous span of space rather than there being just so many discrete points. Um, and, and therefore, to comprehend this, you have to be able to comprehend that not only does everything change, but the change involves contradiction. It involves the idea of being here and there, being you know, in more than one point, because in reality, there isn't such a thing as a single point, uh, but a, a continuous flow of space. Um, but uh, formal logic can't really understand this because it does want to divide things up into these discrete moments. Um, now, formal logic also, and I mentioned before that formal people who uh, practice formal logic treat it as not derived from the material world, as independent from the material world. And, and just a set of rules, self-contained rules for thought. Um, and in, it, treated in this way, it is indifferent to content. Uh, it's just a set of abstract rules. And the advantage of this is supposed to be that these abstract rules can apply to anything. You know, they are universal, they're very clear, and they're just absolutely objective. You, it's, it's true or it isn't true. Um, and it's supposed to be very, therefore, very clear, basically. Um, and it eliminates contradiction. Apparently, that's the, another advantage that it has. Um, but is that true? And can that be true? Well, let's take a famous example, um, what is known as the syllogism, which is the, the statement, uh, if A, then B, A, therefore B. That is considered, in formal logic, a perfectly valid statement, right? And an example of it would be, you know, uh, uh, if a famous example, if it rains, the streets are wet, and then you say it is raining, therefore the streets are wet. That is a valid statement. It you know kind of ticks all the boxes essentially. Um, but according to formal logic, it doesn't matter what the actual premises are, so long as you complete that sort of cycle. So you can also say if it rains, the streets are on fire. It is raining, therefore the streets are on fire. According to formal logic, that is as valid as saying, if it rains, the streets are wet, it rains, therefore the streets are wet. But of course, it's a ridiculous thing to say. Uh, it, and there's no connection between the, the principle of rain and fire that, is, that you can understand. It doesn't it just is complete nonsense, it's incomprehensible. Um, now, it is, according to formal logic, false to flip the, um, the syllogism. So, in other words, to say, if A, then B, B, therefore A. Uh, 
So to go back to our example, that would be if it rains, the streets are wet. The streets are wet, therefore it is raining. Now that is considered false, and it is false, it's true. Because why? Because obviously there are plenty of other things that could cause the streets to be wet. Maybe a, a fire engine, you know, um, was putting out a fire and it sprayed some water somewhere, and therefore the streets are wet. So the, the mere fact that the streets are wet does not prove that it's raining. Um, but how do we know that that is true? That, that it's true, that in other words, how do we know that it's false to say it to put the syllogism in the other way around as I've just given? Only because of real world experience, right? So that's the only thing that can tell us anything about uh, the fact that there can be other causes of streets getting wet or any other particular thing you, you care to mention. It's only knowledge of the real world and the manifold causation that there can be the things that, that the fact that one thing can be caused by many different things such as the streets being wet can be caused not only by rain but but could potentially be caused by a whole host of other things obviously it involves the understanding of what water is etc it only makes sense because we have real knowledge real experience of the principles of the objective world uh, otherwise if we had absolutely no experience how on a, what, what how would any of these terms have any meaning whatsoever now, in 20th century philosophy, where formal logic was adhered to still, it really has held philosophy back. Um, for example, you have what is known as propositional calculus, which is taught in a lot of universities today. And again, this has zero content. It's not about the content. It's not about the actual material things you're supposed to be talking about. It's a set of abstract rules that are supposed to apply perfectly and you just need to learn them. And it's sort of always presented as like almost in, in a mathematical kind of algebraic way, very sort of appears very scientific. Uh, but again, it, it says nothing about the world. It says, seems to comprehend nothing about real human language. For example, if, you're stu if you study it, you will learn that it can only deal with yes or no answers, ambiguities, you know, gray areas, other kinds of uh, answers to things that are not uh, comprehended in this system. Uh, and also you will learn that but is the same as and, so but is eliminated. So any sentence that you want to put into propositional calculus that includes the word but, you get rid of that and you put and in because it means the same thing. But but does not mean the same as and, it is a related term, it has something in common, but there's a gradation of meaning in it and it's, it's important that to have that. If you were to tell that to someone who practices propositional calculus, they would accept that but does mean something, they would say, well, that doesn't matter. That's not really what we're dealing with. And that shows you that propositional calculus and formal logic in general has become this kind of rigid dogma, uh, totally abstract and unable to comprehend the real meanings of human language and thoughts and, of course, of the real world and therefore barren, really. Um, so if, if human thought were to stick and if philosophy does stick to this dogma of formal logic, it inevitably becomes entangled in contradictions. It's true that formal logic expresses a truth which we do need to, to comprehend and that is that you know, things do stay the same. In other words, it would be absurd to insist on calling your friend a different name every minute because they've shed some cells and they've grown some other cells somewhere else. That would be ludicrous. They have fundamentally stayed the same. Um, and that, of course, applies to all kinds of objects. That's what formal logic bases itself upon, and that's very important. We don't go around throwing names and concepts out and out because the, the object has changed in some infinitesimal way. Um, so one side, it expresses one side of the truth, shall we say. But if we stick to that one side, we'll get entangled in contradictions. We won't be able to understand the deeper um, questions of change, of systems, of interconnection, you know, and of basically the fundamental of contradiction and of the transformation of one thing into something other than itself. And that is really the most profound way of understanding the world. How do things change? What are the systems that govern change in the universe? To understand those questions, we will need formal logic, which is what we're going to come on to discuss uh, in the next few weeks.